feelings when you receive it. It's really important because I, I see people, they give it, you know, they'll give it somebody, they get crushed, you know, they get absolutely crushed by this person. And, and then they, they lose faith in that piece of work. And there was probably nothing wrong with the piece of work. You know, it's, it's a process. So one of the things that I say to people always is when you're giving work for feedback, tune into like, it's just to be open to listening to them, to hearing what they have to say and being grateful for it. But it's also tuning into your own feelings and honoring them. If you walk away from a feedback session and you feel crushed and you feel deflated and you feel like shit, and this does happen for screenwriters and filmmakers, I don't know if it happens for composers, I'd be interested, right? Where you just feel totally like shit, right? I'm like, if you walk away from a feedback session, you feel like that, what I recommend to my screenwriters and filmmakers is discard it all. Go have a bath and wash it off and just pretend it never happened, ignore it. It's not, that person was not your person. You don't have to take it on board. You never have to take feedback on board. You're not trying to make everyone happy. You, good feedback, the sign of good feedback is when somebody's giving you lots of stuff. Like they've, it's not that they're just like, oh, you're great, you're amazing, right? They've given you a lot of stuff, but you walk away and you feel like inspired and on fire and like, oh my God, I know exactly what I wanna do and I wanna change this and I wanna change that and I'm gonna do this and it's gonna be amazing. Like that is a good feedback friend. And so I feel as an artist, one of the important things to do is we go down this path is to cultivate, you know, and, and begin to recognize at first, we don't know who those people are going to be in our life. You know, we'll give our work to certain people. And honestly, if you're a screenwriter or filmmaker, you will be shit on, <laughs> you know, like, but what you learn is I'm never giving my work to that person again, never. Right. And they can still be my best friend. I can still be married to them. I can still have them in my family. I can still love them, but you are never getting to see my work again when it's still like in development. And then you realize that the people that are like, oh, that was like, they just, they just help you so much. And those people are like gold, you know, and you go, okay, that's somebody. And as you go along this path, like I now have the people that I go to, you know, and I, I don't have to test it out. I'm not like, you know, because I've, I've learned the hard way. There's certain people in my life. I'll never give them my work before it's completely finished and going out into the world in the bigger sense. But there's other people who are just like so good and so helpful. And those are the people I go to. But it's definitely worth like finding those people, you know, nurturing those people on your path, identifying who they are. And it's a bit of a trial and error in the first place. You just have to give it to a lot of people and find out who they, you know, and you'll find out some of the people that you think will be amazing feedback friends are just terrible. And some people that you might think wouldn't be that great can be really powerful. And I can tell you, it's it's the same case over here where we feel like, you know, not great about a cue or something. And and I think like honestly, that's that should be the name of our majors feedback. I mean, that's like every day of the week what we what we do. And um, it's interesting with, with with scoring particularly because it's yeah, in my opinion, I think with music, it's important to like tap into your your origins and 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 let that bleed through your music. But also like. Um, with scoring, you're kind of tapping into somebody else's origins. And when it goes into that, that stuff where we're in a group meeting and, and, and um, giving feedback to each other, it's really interesting because we'll, we'll have like one clip and then you see like 18 different versions. But a lot of it's subjective. We all come from different Exactly, places. it is subjective. That's the thing. Like ultimately with art, there's no yardstick that we're like, that is good. You see, right. like, there's, there's nothing like that. It's just all opinions. And when it comes to films, I said, it's like the opinions are all over the place. You look at films that come out and people are like, that's amazing. It's the best film that wins all the awards. And five years later, everyone's like, it's a piece of shit. What were we thinking? We were on drugs or something. And then other films, it goes the other way, right? Where it just gets completely ignored when it comes out or even booed, you know, those movies that get booed at Cannes. And then 10 years later, we're like, that's a masterpiece, right? So nobody knows anything. Like that's one of the things. And when it comes to art, I know the screenwriters and filmmakers that I work with, I'm always like, the biggest thing in this journey is to learn how to trust your intuitions, like trust your intuitions and really develop the courage and faith to know that you're just planting a flag in the ground and saying, this is what I stand for. At a certain point, you have to do that. As if you try to make everybody happy, if that's your goal, it's gonna be a disaster. At some point you have to be like, this is, this is what I believe in. And it's finding those other people who believe in the same thing. And when you plant your flag very firmly for what you believe in, you will start to magnetize the people to you who feel the same thing. They're like, oh, I love that flag. And other people are like, I hate that flag. But you've got to have the strength to put your flag in the ground. And then 
and then you'll find your ideal collaborators. But if you're like uh, trying to please people, sneaking around, not really having the faith in yourself, you'll never find your ideal collaborators either. Yeah, that's fantastic. And, um, and, and I guess that would be like maybe a piece of advice if I could give to, to anybody here who's maybe a freshman or something is, is um, I guess our collaborators right now are the students around you and it's great to get feedback from them and from your professors and like, and, and keep learning and absorbing and growing. But at the end of the day, I think like your instincts and, and yes. Um, yes. that's, that should be the, the North Star. Yeah. And I mean, honestly, I think even listening to, you know, this is always the danger, you know, there's, there's the experts, right? The people who know, know, and you've got to listen to them and somehow please them. But nobody knows anything, not even the quote unquote experts. I mean, I've seen this again and again, in my path as a screenwriter and filmmaker, the first script that I wrote, I gave it to a bunch of people who are in the British film industry and they all came back to me and said, you're wasting your time. This is not gonna happen. You're not gonna sell it. It's maybe a nice writing sample. It was a script about Mickey Rourke, which is a bit random, I admit, but it was about Mickey Rourke and a Mexican voiceover actor who had dubbed his movies into Spanish, which is a bit random, but they were all like, you'll never get Mickey Rourke. Cut to a year later, I sold the script and I'm sitting having lunch with Mickey Rourke getting notes on the script. Now, if I'd listened to the experts who all told me you're wasting your time, it's never gonna happen, I would never have sold the script. You know, and I just, I, like there's countless examples in my experience of this kind of thing countless examples you know of people people who know and who do know you know because they've done it for years and they've had lots of success telling you know passing on their wisdom well that's not going to work that's not you know it's like who says like you, nobody knows nobody knows and so if you feel really called to something i i go trust that over anybody else telling you something if you feel in your heart like and, and you just feel a pull towards creating something, doing something, walking a certain path, like even if everybody tells you it's insanity, they, they don't know, your heart knows. That's great. Um, and, and I guess kind of going off all of this and, and the, the instincts and everything, this is a question that I try to ask every interview. Uh, so just a heads up everybody, you'll hear this a lot from me. <laughs> um, but I am curious, like kind of back to your screenwriting process, and I ask this of, of just anybody who writes, um, how much of that process is instinctual versus like planned? And how does that affect kind of your end result and then what you show people? It's, I wanna say it's 100% instinctual, instinctual uh, with very deep planning. <laughs> So there you go. I am 100% as a, as a screenwriter. I, I honestly feel very strongly that I don't create the films or the, the screenplays that I write, but I, I channel them, that they come from somewhere else and that they already exist. And my job is to become a clear channel so that what is coming through can come through. And I might, that might sound like insanity to people here, like what? But that's how I feel about it. It really is. I'm working on a script right now. I'm looking at the board, where, and that's what I mean. So I've got my board. I always outline before I write. Of course I do. You know, that's what I mean. There's planning. I take a long time to build the foundations before I actually write something. And that takes as long as it takes. It's a gestation period. It's like having a baby. It doesn't happen overnight. But I know that that time, as long as I spend planning it and building those foundations, the better the actual writing of it will be. So I take my time with that. And when I'm ready to write, I write. So there's so much planning that goes on before I actually write the screenplay. And I'll have mapped out the whole film. But how I map it out feels to me completely intuitive. I, I absolutely abhor sort of, uh, you know, screenwriting formulas. I think they serve a purpose, you know, maybe sometimes when we're having a problem with a screenplay later on in the process. But to me, like talking about, I don't know, like this needs to happen by this page and this should happen by this page and the first act break should be here and the second act, you know, I it just that kind of talk about films just dries me up inside. It just makes me shrivel up. It's not, it's the opposite of what I experience when I'm writing something. And I can't explain why I write the things that I do. I mean, there's things that you get paid to write, that's totally different. That's just something else. And I guess, 
that's the thing because I've worked on you know I wrote two scripts for instance with John McTiernan who is the, who's the director of movies like Die Hard and Predator and Hunt for Red October so I wrote I rewrote a film with him and then I wrote an original film with him now when I'm doing that kind of work then I'm channeling his vision you know like I feel 100% my job is there to serve his vision like he's got a vision for some movie that I need to help him give birth to and I love doing that work by the way you know like I'm there to help him channel it and it's not my vision and it's great um I I you know there's no ego in that it's just delightful you know uh and, and but there's no ego in me channeling my vision because it's as I say it's not mine you know, like I honestly feel somehow, I feel like the work is more like being an archaeologist. It's like digging out something that already exists somewhere. And I have to, my job is to really dig it out well and dig out all the bits and not break it on the way out and not, you know, bring the wrong bits out, but really to find this treasure. So it's a hundred percent intuitive for me. It's a hundred percent. I mean, with my screenwriting students, I'm always saying, like, for me, I go, storytelling is in our DNA. It's just in our DNA. And if we trust in that and drop into that, we will tell a great story. If we're busy sort of thinking, does it do this? Does it do that? It needs to do this. We need to raise the stakes. It needs to be that. I mean, I think it's like music, you know? And I think filmmaking is so similar to music, you know, because it's about, it's about some sort of energy and it's about rhythm and flow and building things up and then having a little quiet bit and then a big shot. You know, it's, it's the same thing about, I mean, editing, when you're editing a movie, it's just all about rhythm. It becomes completely about rhythm. So it's, I mean, I just, and I think these things are intuitive. I just don't, I don't really under, like I can, for me personally, I can't comprehend it being anything other than that. You know, it's, and I, I can't explain where the stories come from or why, why they are the way they are. I mean, it's, there's just something that's all intuitive. It just flows through. Cause it's also why you write the things you do. The, the story that I'm writing just now, I have no idea why me, like why I'm writing this. I mean, I kind of do, but I kind of don't. And it's about a real woman who now has become such a big part of my life, but it's completely bizarre. It's just completely like, it feels so random and yet also so much like destiny and fate. You know, like I have, like the minute I heard something about her story and I get people all the time reaching out saying, oh, this would be a good story for a film. And I'm like, yeah, it'd be a, I'm sure it would, but it's not for me. This one, it just like lit something in me. And you can't explain that. Like, why did it, why does it light something? In me? I have no idea. But immediately I was like, oh, I got to write this. Like this, I got to write this, you know? And, and, and then you're off. And every day though, you're like, why am I doing this? <laughs> Oh my God, <laughs> just for the record, it's about a, a truck driver for, from Tennessee. A truck driver from Tennessee. I'm obviously the person to write about a truck driver from Tennessee, you know, in the seventies. Yes, why not? <laughs> I just spend my whole life right now on the phone to truck drivers. It's hilarious. You know, it's like, what is that? But it's like, it's something in you that just like, it comes, like the story comes and you're like, I have to do this. I have to do, there's something and I don't know what it is. And maybe sometimes you find out what it is or why it is. And sometimes maybe you don't. Mm. Yeah, I, I mean, that's that's incredible. Thank you for sharing that. And I'm interested in this truck driver. <laughs> <There it is. laughs> like, a truck driver. I mean, me writing a truck driver story. I have no idea. Yeah, I know. So. I'm so sorry. I'm blanking on the name of the film. Um, but I, I know you worked with like a studio and it was there was like a big star in the movie. I made a film called Bleeding Heart. Which, that's what it is, Bleeding yeah. Heart. I just, want to ask you know, about that experience because was that after Obsolidia and, and how was it that uh, process going from independent, you know, fully kind of filmmaking um, to maybe collaborating with? Yeah, it wasn't people. great. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't totally great. Let's put it that way. It just to be nice. Yeah. Uh, it was, it was a hard, it, it, yes. It was a, I learned some, I had some deep, lessons from that experience i mean it's that old thing isn't it the life isn't happening to you it's happening for you and there were definitely things that happened there that i needed to learn so the film it was my idea i pitched it to a company and they immediately picked up on the idea and i got paid to write it and already then it started to become something that wasn't really what i had originally intended but they had different ideas about it this is what happens you know and so then we finished that script and they they took it out to raise money and the first people they went to said yeah we'll bankroll this and 
I met them and I was like, I don't think these are the right people. Like we talked about the script and I went, this doesn't feel like a good fit. And I tried to get out of it. And then though they were very like aggressively wanting to do it. And I got talked into it, you know, and against my better judgment. So when I signed the, the contract to, to make the film with these people, I sort of, I knew it would be hard. I knew it wouldn't be great, but I was also just like, oh, screw it. Maybe I'll never make another movie if I don't do this, you know? Like, like so I better do it and I'll just suck it up and it'll probably be six months and then it'll be fine. And it wasn't six months. It turned into like a year and a half and it wasn't fine. <laughs> it was fucking depressing, <laughs> you know? Because like, is that old thing that people say, um, you know, about relationships, like you're better not to be in one than to be in a bad one. You know, and I would say it's definitely the same with making movies. Like you're better not to make a movie than to make it with people that you're absolutely having a horrible time with. It was not, it was just not good. And there were some good things about it. And one of the things actually I love about that film is the score. Liam did the score for that film. And I felt like actually that score, because that felt like more like his natural, the music that he produces normally is very sort of urban and, you know, came from that, um, uh, you know, I say he was from the sneaker pimp, so it was like the 90s sort of uh, massive attack kind of sound, you know, that kind of thing. And like, I felt like this was, this was his ground because the film is kind of like LA noir, you know? And so I felt like this was his, it was his natural, more urban, more gritty, more uh, suspenseful. I, I thought he knocked it out of the park with the score on that. I that was one of the joys in it. So there were like, there were like bright spots in the whole process, but it wasn't, it wasn't a pleasing process. And I, what I saw really up front, up close is just that thing about, oh, if, if people don't, if they're not trying to make the same film, it, it, you know, it just disintegrates into all kinds of power struggles and it's, it, and you end up with a shitty film for it. It doesn't make the film better. And I don't think the film's shitty. That's not fair to the film. Cause I think like to, to give credit to the people who are in it, Jessica Biel is phenomenal in it. The, the acting across the board is generally great except for one role, I'm not gonna say who it is, but <laughs> generally the acting in it is great. Um, but the actual, the soul of the film, it's not there. You know, because the process that it was being born from was not there. And I sort of feel like when you when everyone is coming together to make a film and they really are making it for the same reasons and it comes from a place of really authentic passion, that's when you're going to create something above and beyond. When it's all like, you know, it's all there, everyone's there for their paycheck and they've got all these little power struggles going on and it's all like this, it's, it's just a shit show. You know, and unfortunately, that's what the making of that film was. And sadly, a lot of the films are like that. I mean, the number of, you know, they, they stand up on the stage together to get awards or something or stand up on the stage together to do the premiere and they all freaking hate each other. You know? <laughs> like seriously, so often, so often, it's horrible. It's not the way to do it. I mean, there's like, there's different ways to make a film and there's definitely a way which is, which is beautiful and pleasing. But that experience for me, definitely, I mean, I came out when, by the time that film was actually finished, and I mean, during the actual edit, I got to the point, I walked away from the movie. I just walked away and said, do what you want with it, I'm done. I was so burnt out. I was just exhausted, you know, drained, sick of fighting all the time, like just everything. I mean, talk about that feedback thing. You're just like, oh, uh, you know, nonstop put through the ringer. And so I walked away from it. And then though, eventually they came back, they begged me to come back because the film was a freaking disaster, a surprise. You know, when they cut it, I mean, the, the cut that they did was just even, it was beyond ridiculous. And yeah, so it was just, it was just like, I mean, it got really ugly, you know, it got really, really ugly. And by the time your film premieres in that sort of situation, nobody's, you know, nobody's happy to see each other. <laughs> Yes, I would say lots of lessons learned. I came out of it feeling very depressed and really like I never want to make a movie again, you know? And before I wrote movies and before I made films, I was a yoga teacher in Barcelona, different lives, different times. And I was like, screw this, I'd rather be a yoga teacher, you know, because like that's, it's happy. <laughs> and, and I feel like I'm doing something good and I'm not wasting my time arguing with jerks. So, <laughs> so, then, so I went through a little phase like that. And then I went through a real struggle with, uh, though thinking really deeply about why do we create art and what's the point you know like what is the point of making art anyway when i mean making a movie is so hard it like everything about it is so hard 
you know? And like, what is the point? Why do we, why even do this in the face of, you know, like it, the odds of it actually succeeding on any level are so slim. And out of that, I, I ended up writing and directing a film called Of Dust and Bones, which is this very curious film because it's very, it's, it's kind of, I mean, now when I see it, I'm like, it's exactly a mirror of my mental, of my psyche. The movie is my psyche at the time. It's about a woman uh, who, whose husband was beheaded by ISIS. So it's not a heavy movie at all. And she's living out in the desert. She's just like retreated to the desert as a recluse and she's building this thing in the desert, uh, this kind of structure. She just spends her days collecting rocks and building a structure. And then this man arrives there and it's sort of what happens between them. And he was, he worked with her husband and it's sort of like he's come with his agenda and it slowly unfolds, slowly being the operative word. <laughs> it's a really slow movie. And, uh, and it's just like a lot of space. And, you know, it was just for me, and this is the funny thing, you make films for different reasons. That was like definitely part of my healing. It was like the equivalent of her building something in the desert was me making that movie. Like, you know, cause the movie is not really, I, you know, it's not very, I don't think it's very enjoyable for people to film. Some people have watched it, have really loved it, but it's a really difficult movie. Well, what I've been thinking about is, as you've been saying, this is kind of the element of your book that I really, really like. It's, um, you have this kind of 16 stage process, uh, which is really neat by itself, but you also like start off each stage with the conventional wisdom and then the kind of rebel heart way of making a movie. Um, and I I think it's great, like what we do and, and everything with the film music and, and it can be, I guess, just limiting in scope when um, our part is just the very, one of the last stages. And sometimes I think as composers, that's all we focus about. Um, but I guess understanding that some films are like miracles being made and um, there's a lot that comes before the, the, the hiring part. <laughs> um, this is gonna be a big question, I guess, but maybe what are the most essential elements if one of us is looking to just make a film that we've been yearning to make our whole life or something? Um, or just understanding that process as a composer, I think would be great. Um, I guess I'm asking for a spark notes. <laughs> this might be a lot to ask for, but, um, or like, if you have a burning desire to make a film, if there's some film inside you that you just feel like, I want this, like you just feel that calling, you make it. That's it, period. It's really easy. <laughs> That's it. I've just made it simple. Cause I'm just like, if you've, if I honestly believe in this life, if you feel a calling in your heart, it's there for a reason. We do not have these desires in our heart by accident. There are nearly 8 billion people on this planet and most of them, don't have the same callings as you. They don't want to make a movie. They don't want to score a movie. It is no interest to them. Like there's all these people who are like, they see a mountain, they're like, I want to climb that. They see someone on a bike. I want to go on a bike and go faster. You know, and it's that thing. Like I think in life, one of the most, one of the most important things that we can learn to do is listen to the callings in our heart. Like what we really honestly desire. What do we want? What do we really, really want? And often an indicator of that is what we feel jealous or triggered by, right? When we see other people doing it. Because if somebody runs a marathon and runs it really fast, unless you want to do that, you don't care. You're just like, good for that. Yeah, that's awesome, right? But when you see someone winning an award for like best composer and you're like, oh, right? It, it's an indicator, it's yours, it's triggering you, right? And it's in your heart. And those things that are in your heart, like I honestly believe if we trust those callings, we cannot go wrong because they're in our heart for a reason and we they're there because we're capable of them because we can do them so if you feel the calling to make a film you make it and that it, it's as simple as that there's nothing to stop you you figure it out you just decide and you deciding is the most powerful thing once you have decided once you have really said to yourself i'm going to do this i'm going to make this happen there's nothing that can stop you and there's no reason for you not to do it you know, I mean, one of my things for me, as I said, for years, I mean, first of all, becoming a screenwriter was like so hard because I just had all this, all this story in my head that was like, I can't do that. I'm not, I won't be good enough. I won't be talented enough. I'm not funny enough. I'm not, I'm not quippy enough. I'm not witty enough. I'm not this, I'm not that, I'm not this, you know? So like working through that to get to write a screenplay was a big deal for me. Then actually deciding to become a director 
uh, was another whole big deal because when I directed my first film, Obsol Lydia, that was my first film. I'd never directed a short before. I'd never directed a music video. I'd never directed a commercial. I didn't correct, direct anything. And I, but I just decided, you know, and I just decided really like, I wrote that script and I was like, I don't think anyone could do this better than me. And it wasn't like an arrogant thing. It was just like, this is mine. Like no one, you've seen the film, so you know, it's a quirky film. It like, and it's just like, I don't think anyone else would read this and really get it the way that, like, I know what it's meant to be. And it is, it's a weird, it's a, I mean, it's a weird film. It's not, uh, I, I don't think, I think there's like quite a few things that you're like, that's weird, uh, you know? So once you just decide though, and you go, okay, I'm going to do this, you'll figure it all out. Everything falls into place. You start taking that action, you create that, you set that intention, you start taking the action towards it you will become unstoppable. And it's that thing where you just go, I'm just, I'm making, like, I just knew, I was like, I'm making this movie. There's nothing that's gonna stop me. I have no idea how I'm gonna get the money. I have no idea how any of this is gonna work, but I'm gonna do it. And that, and I did it. And I, I just go for the same for anybody, uh, anybody here, if you want to make a movie, it, it, whether it's a short film or a feature, and that's the thing about trusting your, what you're guided to do. People ask me all the time, do I have to make shorts? Do I have to do this? You don't have to do anything. This is the beautiful thing about our lives. You don't have to do anything. You can do whatever the fuck you want. And the great thing about that is like, you don't need anyone's permission, right? You, like you just decide, right? And no one can tell you. Like the great thing making movies, like no one's gonna die. As long as you adhere to certain like safety rules, <laughs> no one's gonna die. It's gonna be fine. So it's like, once you've decided and you know, you just go, okay, I'm, I'm doing this and I'm just gonna make it happen and I'm gonna learn and I'm gonna figure it out. And each step of the way, there will be challenges and I know it's not always going to be easy and I know it's going to be tough and I don't control the outcome of it and that's fine I'm going to do it anyway because I'm going to grow from this I'm going to learn from this and that's it so it's probably not the practical advice you were looking for you were looking for like <laughs> but how do I <laughs> well here's here's my follow-up question how is never the problem I'm just gonna say the how is never the problem right you know like we all get caught up in how but how how do I get the money the how is not the problem. Once you change your mindset, and seriously, this sounds like hooey, but this is absolute truth. Once you get into the space of like, I'm doing this no matter what, it will fall into place. You will figure it out every step of the way. And it will never be how you thought. I mean, that's the thing about formulas of how to do it. You know, every person who's done it will tell you how they did it. You will do it in your own unique way. Your path will be your own path. There's no two paths that are the same. The important thing is you know where you want to go and you start walking there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's incredible. And and um, I do truly like resonate with that. I guess my follow-up question, <laughs> which might sound practical again, <laughs> but I guess Sorry. what are some like common mistakes you see in kind of the filmmaking journey? Um, that maybe just would be good for composers to know, like, or, or just anybody to know who's in the film industry. Um, I don't know. And that's another like yardstick. I like, well, I'm making general, common mistakes. But... Cause I mean, like for composers, it's probably something different. Cause my immediate thought about common mistakes is like an unrealistic plan. So it does get into the how, you know? And, and the unrealistic planning thing sort of kills me with films because a lot of films, they don't have a chance to be good even before they're shot, you know? And I always get into it with my filmmakers and with people. I go like, what you'd be looking for? And this is why I'm always like, over a hundred pages, you're crazy because you're probably looking at, at best 20 day shoot, at best. I think my first film, I think it was 17 or 18 days. I know that my second film, despite having more than 10 times the budget, I got one extra day of shooting. So, you know, like this is the reality of indie shoots these days. Like the most you'll get is 20 days. So if you have a 100 page script, then you're going to be looking at an average of five pages a day. That's doable. If you have 120 pages, then you're looking at, do the math quick, 120 divided by five, six, six, right? six pages, six. Is that right? Everyone's like quiet. Yeah, six times 20 is 120. I see we've got the mathematicians on the call. So, <laughs> so, um, so like every day that like every time when it gets to be more pages, like I go the maximum you want to do is five pages a day. Otherwise you just don't have time to make it beautiful, to make it exceptional, to make every moment as, as great as you imagined it before you shot it. And something that kills me is when people 
go into shoot a film and you go you look at their budget and schedule and you go you haven't got a shot like it you've got a great script you've got a great cast you've got all these great things and you're you've not got a shot at making a good film because you don't you haven't given yourself enough time you know and you're, you're thinking you're going to do two company moves one company move a day is going to lose you two hours that day right so if you have a company move every day that week that's the equivalent of losing one day of shooting you know, it's, it, it's not worth it. So it's like, it's really, I think that is such an important part of it. Uh, and such an important, like a big mistake that I see. And it just is a heartbreaking one because, you know, to come that far and actually get a movie into production, but then not, and I've experienced it myself with Bleeding Heart. There's one sequence in particular, which it kills me. What it was, what it was on the page and what it was meant to be was something so different to what we got. because We just didn't have time. They, it wasn't scheduled properly. We didn't have enough time to do it. And then, you know, on the day you're like, we're not getting it. Like it's, like we have to move on and we haven't got it and it kills you because you're like this is shit we're gonna have to like patch things together in the editing room as best we can but we just didn't get it so that's that's like definitely uh one of the one of the mistakes i think the other mistake when it comes to like music and composing is the old um the 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 belief that you know we're gonna get this song that's really expensive <laughs> you know and people like a lot of directors make the mistake of putting in different songs as temp tracks when they're editing the film and then they get very attached to them and they can't wrap their head around not having that song there but that song the rights for the song are going to be like twenty thousand dollars or something you know just just for the one song and if you've got a film that's costing you two hundred thousand dollars that's ridiculous it's not going to work we with obsolidia funnily we kind of fell into that trap ourselves in an odd way. It, I'd, I put at the end of the movie for the end titles, a song by, it was, it's called It's a Wonderful Life by a, a band called Black. I don't know if you've ever heard this song. It was a really big song in the like late eighties. And there was a beautiful acoustic version of it that I found. And we put that on as the music at the end titles. And Liam, my freaking composer, he got attached to it too. Cause he was like, that song is just perfect there. <laughs> you know. And, and we were just really attached to it. And so when we got into Sundance, we reached out and we found out we could get festival rights for quite a small amount of money. Like, you know, I can't remember, but a thousand dollars or, you know, something like this, $2,000 festival rights only. So we paid that for it. And I, I counsel people against this big mistake. Don't do this. If you're working with a, a filmmaker and they're sort of like, let's just get festival rights for the song. Just say to them, don't do it. Uh, what, what will happen is you'll grow even more attached to it and stuff. And then it's like, okay, are you gonna pay for the full rights? You have this fancy at this point that a distributor is gonna swoop in and pay for the full rights for that song. You know, they're gonna pay the big bucks for the full rights. And nine times out of 10, that isn't gonna happen. And then you're gonna have to, before you release your film, you're gonna have to go back in there and opening a film up once it's all done to actually change the soundtrack is a freaking pain in the ass, you know, and it's, and it's a big deal. So it's not worth it. That's what we had to do. So, you know, six months later or a year later when we actually wanted to release the movie, we had to go back in there to take that song out because we couldn't, we didn't want to pay for the, the full rights, which again was a, probably about $10,000, but it's like, for what, you know? This is not, this doesn't make or break the movie. Like paying that amount of money for the rights at that point just seemed stupid. So we took it out and you know what we replaced it with? <laughs> a moment of genius, a meditation bell. It's just a meditation bell at the end of our film when the when the end, end titles crawl which by the way is one of the shortest end title credits because hardly anyone worked on the movie <laughs> so, so it's not like watching the latest marvel film or something you know where it's like 20 minutes of credits it's like two minutes of credit, a minute it's probably like 45 seconds of credits it's just a meditation bell so we took out the song i did kind of miss the song it was nice having the song when we had festival screenings at ended it in a certain way. I don't know if the meditation bell, I don't know, but I love the meditation bell. And we kind of all fell in love with the meditation bell and felt like that's the perfect ending to our movie. You know, it's a mindfulness bell. Seeing uh, seeing credits that short though is super impressive, I have to say. I'm like, oh my, like what I just saw is that just that team. Like, Whoa. Like, um, so I know we're kind of at the hour now um, and some people have class, but if anybody has any questions, please feel free to unmic. If, if you're willing to stay maybe a couple minutes over. Yeah, no problem. I have a couple more questions. Maybe one. Anyone have any questions? And I suppose I have, uh, oh, was someone else going? <laughs> Hi, I'm April. Uh, thank you so much for being here. This was fantastic. Um, I did have a question just about 
how you said with that film, you didn't really feel connected with it. You walked away, you came back, you didn't really want to do it. Um, just how like you said after that feeling, you were just like, oh, that really sucked and how you got out of that sort of thing. Um, I just wanted to hear your thoughts on like when you see your name attached to that, like that's a forever thing now. And that's always going to be a thing that's like really bothersome to you. Um, no, it's not. It's not. It didn't because it ended up actually going back to my cut. Oh, well, that's good. <laughs> so Patty Beal intervened. Well, I actually like I reached out to her and went, "This is a freaking shit show," and and she had just seen their cut of the movie, and she was like, "What happened to our movie?" And so I sent her my cut of the movie, and she was like, "This is the cut of the movie," and you know things have evolved there. But you can imagine how much the producer loved me at this point when he's got Jessica Biel's manager, like a hard tackling him about stuff, you know, it was not pretty. So I don't like, it did go back to my cut. It was kind of, it was just weird. And the energy is just off by then. Like I wasn't, I didn't love my cut either at that point, you know, cause I'd been so beat up and told it was shit like a million times. So, you know, it just wasn't, it just wasn't, it just wasn't a good energy, but I'm happy for my name to be on the movie. I didn't want my name to be taken off the movie. I still feel like there's bits in it that are totally me. If you watch the film, you'll be able to tell those bits. <laughs> you'll be like, cool. that's one of our bits. And then you'll be like, what is this? <laughs> yeah, so I guess just kind of leading into that, sorry, I have another one if no one has. Um, so when do you kind of know like, okay, this is the time I put my foot down and when to say like, okay, this is kind of a thing I can move with or yeah, I agree that completely changes kind of thing. This was like the real challenge in that situation because to be honest, so I was working with this one producer who really, I think his MO was, unless I unless the person fights for it, they're not passionate about it. And if they're not passionate about it, then we shouldn't do it. Like that was kind of how he operated. And so everything, he wanted you to fight for it. Otherwise it wasn't a thing. Even something like, you know, I wanted to use the same director of photography that I'd used in my first film, but he goes, I don't think we should use him. I think we should get somebody else. And I'm like, what? My director of photography in my first film, I mean, he won best cinematography at Sundance for fuck's sake with my movie. Like, why would you not want to hire him? Right, like that's insanity. You know, so I would have to say, look, unless you hire him, I'm leaving the movie, right? I mean, this was like a, basically an every two day occurrence that I would have to do this brinkmanship. And then he would go, okay, fine, we'll hire, we'll hire the DP. I like your DP, it's gonna be great, right? And this is how it would go. Like everything was like this, you had to fight for it. And to be honest, when you make a movie like that, the problem is, is that you don't always know the right fights. And in hindsight, when the dust settled, I saw sometimes I fought the right ones and sometimes I really didn't. You know, and there were some things like, and, and, and the person that I was fighting with, I guess he had no vision at all. Like I remember actually in the final sound edit of the movie, so he came for the very, very final sound mix to sit, in the, sit with us while we did it. And I remember at the very end of that film, that film ends, Jessica Biel drops to her knees, you know, and then there's a, you're on a close up of her and then there's a wide shot, uh, you know, of the scenario. And then it, the screen goes to white, right? And it's the end of the movie. And there is, <laughs> you're gonna see a, a, a theme here. There's a, there's a yoga chant. There's a chant that comes in, okay? So when we were, we, we're, we're watching the end of it, the yoga chant came in over her, the close up of her, right? And he goes, no, 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 the, the, you shouldn't come in there. It should come in afterwards. It should come in in the wide shot. It should not come in on her face, right? It's gonna be so much better if it's on the wide shot. So I'm like, cool, let's try that. You know, and I've like me, we had already selected it over her face, but I'm like, fine, let's try that way. I, I have no, I'm not, I'm not attached to it. Let's do it. So we try it and I was like, fine, I like that. Let's do that. You know, and this is what you do, right? So it's always like, uh, is it something that you feel like you've got to really fight for? Or is it something you're fine with? Well, the next day we're doing the, ab, you know, we're doing the watching over it to make sure we're happy with all the things. And somehow it had gone back to being over her face. Don't ask me how, right? Like by accident, it was meant to be over the, the white shot. And this time he's like, I love that. That is so great. That's amazing. That's exactly what it should be. And you're like, oh my God, yesterday you argued like really passionately that it had to be in this other place. And today it's like, and that's that thing where you're like, this person doesn't even <laughs> know what they're like. They don't know what they want. They don't know what they want. I told you that. <laughs> you did, didn't you? <laughs> Say hi. Hi. <laughs> We've got an invader. This is Theo. Say hi. So I mean, <laughs> so the the issue is really like 
you don't you don't always know which fights i mean i think in yourself you have to check in and go like i always want to be open to the suggestions i want to be, i love collaborating right and the best idea will often not come from me it will come from somebody else so i try to maintain always an openness to all the suggestions and if i feel though really firmly that it is something else you know so somebody will say hey what about if we, you know this is like collaborating with everything the dp might be like why don't we shoot it like this and you know he'll put together a frame and I, I look at it and I go it's just not what it you know like I'm open to looking at it but then if it's not it I'm gonna I'm gonna say and again that's a very intuitive process I feel like as a creator I can't always explain why I feel like one way is better than the other but I just feel it and if it's something that I feel very strongly then I'm gonna fight for it if it's something that I don't like you know like where the yoga chant started at the end of the movie didn't actually bother me i felt there was an argument for for each and every way if it started on the white if it started on her face if it started there was arguments for each of those and i didn't feel married to any of them but it's i mean yes it's it's not easy to navigate my the the answer really is to work with people though who i, I was just about to say who are saying but but you know who are like who are, who are you know who are respectful and and share and share a same vision and a same way of working as you do i think that's the thing because then you don't have to fight for everything you know then it's like conversations and it's always the best idea wins but somebody has to be the decider of what the best idea is and really to me most of the time that should be the director cool yeah thank you so much <laughs> you're welcome Thanks Amy, for asking. Oh, he's about to play the piano, I think. We can oh get the piano music in a minute. <laughs> well, um, if anybody else doesn't have any other questions. Oh, well, we have to see this. Like, <laughs> <laughs> the piano is coming. <laughs> That's it's going to be a disaster in a minute. <laughs> um, well, of course, I, I have numerous other questions, but but maybe one day we'll have you. <laughs> but the piano is happening. <laughs> 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 oh, I'm so sorry. Theo. Uh, fine. He's like just smiling. He just he so knows that he shouldn't touch the piano when he's he's doing his Berkeley application. We'll we'll get him here. <laughs> oh, yeah. I love that the other day he was hitting the low notes. He said, This is the scary sounds, you know? Oh, wow. it, it is so funny, right? That like that thing of just sounds and music, how that will just tune us into a feeling so much. I mean, it is amazing when you're making a film and getting the music in it. It's just, it's like night and day, night yeah. and day. What you're yeah, I mean, Theo's making me feel something right now. I don't, it's <laughs> 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 funny. Um, but anyways, I, I just want to thank you again so much for coming. And um, I got a lot out of this and it's, it, it inspires me to like, you know, maybe write a screenplay myself. And, and um, I think there's a lot to learn from that. So Thank you so much again and thank you everybody yes. for tuning in. I think I think that musicians and composers make great writers. It's mm. music. There's it's just like I mean, it's funny because I'm teaching one screenwriter right now and she's a she is a a musician and a composer and, and you know and I go, it's like it's the same it's there's something very similar because cinema is sound and vision. You know, cinema is sound and vision. It's not uh, you know, this is to me always the difference between like TV and cinema. You know, we're aiming for something that synthesis of the sound and vision to create an experience. And at its best, it's such a beautiful thing. It's not like just talking heads. Yes. All right. Well, thank you so much. I mean, every your input has been fantastic. And um, thank you so much. And <laughs> everybody, go buy "Shoot from the Heart" that book. It's it's really. Kind of yeah, it's a real nuts and bolts. That book is like there's a mix, but it really guides. If you do want to make a film, it will totally guide you through it. You know, it will totally give you a lot of practical tools to make it happen. Right, right. Sorry, I just <laughs> the so pianist funny. is like. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. what happens. That's what happens when you have a three-year-old in the house. That, that's what happens exactly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Well, I hope to see you again, Diane. And thank yeah, you. Thank you so much. <laughs> I've so, got my outro music. Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much. Great. Thank you. Great. Bye. Bye.